Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm here to speak about some aspects of the Taubman approach. And I have a hard time, um, for those of you who are repeat, uh, repeat watchers, um, I have a hard time starting these lectures without first saying a word of thanks to those who've worked with me. Um, and even one woman who has not worked with me. So it is called the Taubman Approach because of a woman named Dorothy Taubman. Um, I'm sure various uh, ones of you have differing knowledge of who she was and what she did, but she had just this remarkable sense for looking at what a pianist was doing and spotting the things that were inefficient and looking at it and saying, this is what you can do better. And so the woman that I learned the Taubman approach from, or the variation of it that I, that I teach, uh, her name is Sheila Page. And she, um, she studied the, the technique for many, many years. And she started to have some ideas. She had a background in Alexander technique as well. And she had some ideas about the technique as it applied beyond just the forearm. Um, and as I understand it, a lot of people in the Taubman approach have moved beyond it just being in the forearm, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, one thing that, uh, a couple things that she, that she was innovative, I think, though, in thinking in this, in this way was that your forearm is attached to an upper arm, which is attached to a torso, which has head and legs and everything attached to it. But even more importantly, or at least as importantly as all of those physical things, we also have a spiritual, mental, and emotional self that we have to take care of. And so she founded her keyboard wellness seminar, which dealt with all of that. And um, I was fortunate to attend and be on the administrative staff of that seminar for, I think I did 10 seminars. Um, and I learned a lot during that time. I was fortunate throughout my entire college career to study with teachers who were trained by her and had just a wonderful knowledge and incredible patience. And all I can say is that that experience has helped me develop my passion for helping teachers help their students. So a lot of what I'm giving you today is hopefully going to be helpful to you as you go to teach. And, and of course, hopefully as you practice, you know, it will be helpful to you. But primarily, especially when it comes to the examples, I'm going to be targeting uh, early things. And, and, and this is the technique, and this is how I recommend teaching it. So hopefully this will be a benefit to you in that, in that regard. So we've talked, we've done now a lecture on um, three of the four forearm, uh, of the three of the four forearm movements. I said the right thing. Uh, we've talked about rotation. We've talked about in and out or backward and forward, or forward and backward, I suppose, um, depending on how you, what verbiage you prefer. We've talked about up and down. And today we're gonna be talking about lateral, left and right motions. All right. And I was just, uh, I was talking to Christina. She, she arrived here a bit earlier, and uh, I was mentioning that this is not one that a lot of people talk about very often. Um, I, I, I would even say I don't talk about it so much as I instill it via demonstration with my students from the very beginning. The, the motion between all notes has to include some amount of left and right. And I think that oftentimes it's not thought about in those regards. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of demonstrating with my overhead camera today, which I am woefully unprepared to pull up. I apologize for that. But I want to just show you some things regarding lateral forearm motions or motion. So we have to recognize, first of all, that every motion, and I talked quite a bit at length about this in the last lecture, so you may go back and watch the in and out, up and down, but every motion, rotation, 
in, out, up, down, and right, left, they all have different functions. And there has to be an element of each one between every two notes, even though one might be more prominent in this motion and the other might be more prominent in that motion. Um, rotation accomplishes the speedy transfer of arm weight. I guess I'm talking about it here, I forgot. <laughs> uh, the speedy transfer of arm weight from balance point to balance point. And the in and out and up down motions accommodate the different lengths of fingers and heights of keys. Now those, those are very, uh, that's, that's a very simple summarization of the many, many things that each of those things uh, are for. The place that we tend to most notice lateral forearm motion or, or arm motion is in leaps. So, of course, you know, everybody knows the famous, you know, Tchaikovsky, you know, that, that motion across. And of course, in, in, in something like that, it's clear to see that the arms are moving right and then leaping very quickly left. However, lateral motion I believe should be introduced from the very beginning, even in, and especially in, I would say, stepwise passages. So for example, if you have a student working on pentascales, of course, I have a large hand that easily rests over five keys. But most of our young students, their hands do not rest easily over five keys. A lot of them have to stretch out like something like this to, to be comfortably on five keys. So instead, we want to make sure our students are comfortable with being on the note that they are on and understanding that from this note to this note, and it, it's a little hard to see, but there is a slight shift to the right for each note as I step. And it can't be that, it can't be too much of a shift because it's not too much of a shift on the piano, but it has to be there. It's a little bit more noticeable as I start to play scales. Of course, you can see there's one big shift right there in the middle over to the right. But even between those first three notes, if I keep my arm from moving, if I hold it still, you can see my elbow's kind of yanked in. I'm not really able to move, I'm moving up but I feel locked. Um, also, lateral forearm motion is the most prevalent motion in broken intervals. A lot of times, um, we tend to think that rotation is the most prevalent motion in broken intervals. Trills, for example. And, and rotation is an important motion. I would say rotation of all of these motions is the most important because it's how we transfer that arm weight. The other motions more deal with, um, what's a good way of saying it? They deal kind of with the, with the carriage overall so that there's, there's this shape, and we'll get into that when we talk about forearm shaping, but there's this overall shape that the other motions accomplish and rotation's function is to put the weight of the keys, or the weight of the arm into the keys. So even if you have just broken seconds or thirds, it's more about the left and right motion than it is about the rotation. So this is just rotating and not really moving left and right. It sounds kind of stiff. My arm is starting to feel tired. All right. But if I allow for that, for that left and right motion, that's a lot better. It still isn't the most desirable sound. And you'll have to forgive me. This piano also needs some work done on it. So it's not the best sounding piano to begin with. But um, that, that being aside, um, now if I add a little bit of in and out and up and down, get a comfortable speed going. Now, there's not a ton of times that you have um, just that, that pattern going, but if, if you do, there you go, you have it. Um, a lot of times, 
where we really have to watch it is, is as we start introducing our students to larger intervals. So for example, you know, as adults, we get used to seeing a lot of broken octaves, right? All right, and right, again, right there, it's that left, left, right motion. Yeah. So it's more about this than it is about rotating. If it was all about rotation, that's what it would look like. And if I didn't rotate and just moved left to right, <laughs> I can't do it. All right, it, it's too, it's too uh, sloppy. Oh, someone else is here in the waiting room. Let me let them in. So um, we don't want to wait until our students are playing octaves to introduce this concept to them. We first, like I say, we first want to introduce them moving across left and right. You know, I, I mentioned a couple lectures ago that I often start with the thumb for rotation, and that also helps them understand the function of the arm moving left and right. But even when you move away from that and you're moving from finger to finger, they have to understand that there is that motion of the entire arm from left to right. Um, but as we move beyond that, as we move into broken intervals, you might consider starting with a fifth, you know, so that they start to feel that left-right motion. Of course, for me, that, that, that's a totally different motion, you know, a six, a six is better. And, and I believe, well, I have an example in a minute um, of, some, of some broken six, but a six is, is perhaps more likely to be encountered by them. And again, it's, it's just about that motion left and right. And that allows for that to, um, allows for that to occur. Lateral motion, you may have noticed it as I started climbing up, lateral motion requires often, when you have a series of notes ascending or descending the piano, um, a, a, a large range of the piano, requires a change in arm angle. So I often, with my students, I often tell them to think of their arms like windshield wipers. And it's, it's not a great, it's not the best example, but it's the only example I can think of, um, to think of their arms like windshield wipers on a car. In, in the sense that, and let me show you this from the full body camera so that you can see. I do describe to them the idea of the elbow as an anchor to allow the forearm to move like this. But at the same time, I don't want them to get a stuck elbow. I don't want them to feel like the elbow can't move at all. So the elbow is going to kind of be wobbling back and forth, you know, and that's going to allow. So as my arm, let me go back to overhead. As my arm moves out this way, my elbow is most this way. As my arm moves this way, my elbow moves outward a little bit. Um, and like I say, that's, that's, that's something that they can see to where, you know, I've got, a, I've got a fairly stationary elbow. It moves a little bit. It needs to, but it's not, it, I'm not moving my elbow out like this is the point. Because when, when we start talking about lateral motion, students tend to think, oh, I've got to move myself like this, which is really fun to see them, you know, play their scales with their elbows stuck up in the air. So allowing that elbow to be released and supported and act as a sort of anchor for the arm to move out and in and across this way, that way, is wonderful. Um, one of the things that I'm uh, going to talk about is bringing the arm in front of the torso. And this is something that um, my mentor, who I mentioned earlier, Sheila, actually talks about in her first lecture on anatomy and posture. And I felt it was, uh, not, that, not that she's wrong and I'm right, um, but for myself, I felt that it, it's more appropriate to this lecture. So we know that one of the things we want to avoid is the twisting of the wrist, moving the wrist like this. We want to keep it in alignment with the, this knuckle of the fourth finger, this end of the ulna at the wrist, and this end of the ulna at the elbow in a fairly straight line. Um, well, I guess there's no such thing as an unstraight line, so, you know. Um, 
but we want them to be in alignment with one another. And the arm, the wonderful thing is that the arm can come in front of the torso without twisting. So uh, the unfortunate reality is when a lot of our students begin, the method books stick them on middle C. Sometimes it's really unfortunate and we get the, the infamous middle C position. And when that happens, I'm not opposed to it necessarily for any technical reasons. Um, we can argue about reading reasons in, in another forum and another discussion, but if they're going to be playing with their arm in front of them, first of all, their thumb should never be trying to share a key. All right, it just doesn't work. So off the bat, middle C position, it just has to disappear and either have the right hand thumb on D or the left hand thumb on B, depending on what notes are, are needed. All right. If neither of them are needed, then don't have the thumbs, don't require the thumbs to be stuck on, on one key or another. All right. But I will often actually start a beginner regardless. I'll start them, if, if the book starts in middle C, middle C position, I'm using air quotes, they're probably a little hard to see in, from overhead. Um, I'll often start them an octave out on either side. So then I don't have to worry about teaching them how to bring their arms in front of them because they've got enough that they have to think about. They don't, they don't want to be thinking about everything that I just told you. So at least to get them started, you can have them move out an octave. But eventually, they are going to have to learn how to play in front of the torso, as we all have to. You might notice, you might have noticed, as I bring my arm in, it takes on an odd angle. Just as when I go this way, it takes on an odd angle. It's not, uh, my fingers are not, and my hand and my arm are not parallel to the keys. They're starting to become per perpendicular. Now, there does become a point where it becomes ridiculous. I, I don't necessarily want to be doing this as I, as I go across. There comes a point where I need to move over. But it's okay, for a little bit at least, for your arm to take on this. Now there's another important thing that, that happens, and I'm going to show you from the side. As you come in front of the torso with your arm, and here's where I will bring out my friend Bob, Bob the Skeleton Arm, if you haven't met him. He says hello, and what, what more appropriate day to have a skeleton arm than Halloween. Um, so. I didn't talk about it in this regard when I talked about the anatomy, and I didn't even have the skeleton to show it at that point. But we have to remember that the arm includes, and it looks a little washed out, but the arm includes the clavicle and the scapula. The clavicle, the collarbone, goes right into here, all right? And because that's a part of the arm, that allows the arm to move in all the way to that point. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you want to crunch in like this, pull yourself in like that. I'm saying the arm can come over and stay free as long as it's engaged to here and not pulling in at the shoulder. And I think I addressed that somewhat. But now you have the, vis the visual. So when I come in front of myself, I want to have that freedom at the collarbone to bring my arm in front but there's also something else that needs to happen. Assuming I'm sitting balanced, I also want a slight, and it's very slight, inclination backwards. So I use my rocker bones, my sit bones, to move myself backwards. And that allows me to bring my arm in front of my body without restriction up here and without a twist here at my wrist. All right? And we'll talk more about that, and, and I'll go back to the side view in a minute, um, but we'll talk more about that in regards to other motions in a minute. But you can see I can bring my arm in front of myself, and it works for both hands. I can have both hands there in the middle of the keyboard, no twist, and I'm able to play quite comfortably. All right. Then, let's see. Okay, well, I got to it sooner than I, than I anticipated. So when I am moving in extremes, when I'm moving, for example, again, in that Tchaikovsky, all right, 
how do I accomplish that motion without, you know, yanking myself across like that? That's not a very comfortable, and, and, and as much, you know, when you pull yourself across here, it just doesn't feel well. So what I would want to do is, again, whenever, whenever you have a motion of the torso to either the left or the right, you don't want to just move straight over to the right, or straight over to the left, it's, it's the direction I move. So to start that, I don't want to be like this, all right? Instead, the first thing I want to do is shift backwards slightly, like I did for my, for my central position. Shift backwards slightly, and then to the left. And here I am, and I'll show you this in the overhead in a minute, no twist. Now, I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can, this is just moving to the left. This is how far over I have to move to be comfortable. If I move back first and then to the left, that's how far to the left I have to move. And I still feel anchored in my sit bone, all right? I don't feel like I'm about to fall off. I don't have to do what I was taught to do as a teenager and throw my leg out, in my, my right leg out in the opposite direction to keep myself from falling off of the bench. So I start here, start here, and now I'm going to go back to my central, but I'm going to keep my torso back because now I'm playing in front of myself, and now I move to the right. Now this is, this here is an extreme, this here is almost at the top of the keys, and I think, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, so I think I've got the octave placement right on these, but if I don't, please don't think less of me. Um, it's not in my repertoire. Um, so as I move to this, I have a couple things I have to do. I'm going to shift to the right, yes, but because I have to shift a lot further to the right, as I get up to the top, I'm actually going to incline myself back in just a little bit so that because of even going back and going to the right, this still feels like a lot. But if I go back, right, and then I move in a little bit like this, and you can see it in my, in my arm. So I'm kind of moving, leaning forward over this, allowing, taking advantage basically of muscles that run across the um, torso like this and like this, that allow me to, um, it, it, this is an, uh, an Alexander uh, term, but allow me to spiral, all right? So I'm, I'm spiraling. Forward. So again, I feel in balance, so I'm able to, I'm, I'm back and left, center, spiral. And then that doesn't feel like so much. And I'm able to maintain without a twist. Let me show that to you in the overhead camera. Let's see. Let me try to let me try to do it with my brain this time. All right, um, and so that that gives me quite a bit of of leverage. Now, let's say I'm playing something where, um, like at the end of the list concerto, and that I know even worse, uh, the, uh, the first list concerto, but I do know the hands are moving in opposite directions. You're moving out, you know, um, what is it? You know, you, you have a whole run into that. Anyways, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly matter, but if you're, it, it doesn't go to the extreme range of the piano, but let's pretend for a moment like it does. Your arms are going to increasingly become less centered. Now, when I have something like this, where I'm moving across like so, one hand is going to be more angled in front of the body than the other. This one's going to be fairly straight. But when both hands are in opposite extremes of the keyboard, then you're going to have that outward angle of the arm for both hands. And it also requires, and maybe you can see it in the overhead camera a little bit, it requires a slight inclination forward of the torso, again, taking advantage of the rocker bones. Um, so now I have a couple examples just to kind of, uh, uh, I guess, solidify some of, the uh, some of the concepts I've talked about. 
Um, like I say, these are not necessarily from the advanced literature, but um, I'm trying, I, there's a lot of teachers, uh, Sheila Page included, who teach teachers and teach, you know, university and conservatory students who are playing the advanced literature. And I'm not, I'm not trying to encroach into that area of the world. I want to make this something that a lot of us are teaching what I often describe and not in any sort of derogatory, it's not a derogatory term, but we are teaching what I call average students. You know, in other words, students who probably aren't going to go on and pursue a musical career, but a lot of them are participating in, at least in recitals, often in festivals or competitions, you know, they're, they're good music students. Um, and so they don't deserve to play with poor technique, or I should say, yeah, they don't deserve to play with poor technique. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about in a minute that all this technical jargon is in service to them playing musically eventually, which is, of course, our goal for our students is to have them play music. So the first example is from the third movement of the Mozart K332 sonata. Um, and this is, this is kind of on that early advanced cusp after I finish giving that, giving that uh, speech, but don't worry, I have some, some intermediate examples as well today. Um, but this is kind of, I guess, on that early advanced cusp. Um, you know, you, you might have a student play this at some point. I would, I'd certainly recommend having a student play this movement to get the right hand used to this lateral motion before I had a student play the first movement of Beethoven Pathétique, um, where the left hand has all those, all those broken octaves that it has to deal with. So the portion of this that I'm going to be uh, talking about, it's in that example sheet that I sent uh, the link to, but the portion I'm gonna be talking about, I didn't put the measure numbers down. It is measures, I guess, I, I probably it's on there differently. I'm looking at a different edition. Um, but I'm going to be talking about measure 68 to the downbeat of measure 70, all right? And this is a, this is a fun little passage, and we'll actually talk about it again when we get, go back to talking about shaping. But right now, we're just going to talk about this in regards to lateral motion. And again, when you get a passage that looks like this, any student who's learned about rotation is automatically going to see Oh, okay, this is just a bunch of single rotations. It's just... I didn't go down far enough. <laughs> da, 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 da. All right. Um, they're going to see that and they're going to think, oh, it's, it's just single rotations. And it is. It is. There are single rotations there. I don't know why I keep stopping early there, but um, there, there are single rotations there. But in that realm, there's also in and out and up and down, you know. But the prominent motion, the, the motion that, that needs to be finessed the most here is the left to right. They need to recognize that between each of these, have that, that motion of the arm, uh, left, right, left, right, left. The other thing that, that they don't tend, we don't tend to think about is we, we tend to see, okay, I have these six. I have this, 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 this. And so we tend to ignore the fact that we have this seventh. And so if we, if we kind of regroup how we think of it and we start here, and then we have right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Because oftentimes we look at that and we think, well, it's just six. And, and I'm, I'm not knocking, by the way, this, this method of, of practicing, but then we, we tell our students, you know, well, just block the six and play the six. And, and then we say, well, you can do that. Why can't you, why can't you play? because they're thinking about the sixth then, but if instead they think about the seventh, and then they get that, that motion in there. So 
sorry. I, 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 changed, I tried changing my fingering earlier when I was practicing this because I'm used to putting a four there, but a lot of our students aren't going to be able to put a four there. They're gonna to need to put a five there. So we have, to, we have to accommodate that, but we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into forearm shaping. But basically, yeah, let's see. I feel like that's probably about as good as that's going to get for right now. Um, but, but having that, that left and right motion is very important. And, and you don't want it just to be, um, you don't want it to just be rather um, rotation or in and out and up and down. You want, you want to really feel that, that motion, especially to the left, down the seventh. And then you have that which, again, we'll talk about a little bit more when we get into the shaping portion. Okay, um, then I have another example. Um, this is maybe something that you would have a little more chance. And this, by the way, um, I, I'm, not, I'm getting no commission if they sell extra copies of these. Um, but uh, this is Melody Bober's Moonlight Fantasy. And this is a really fun, big-sounding piece. It has some good challenge moments in it for our students. Um, so, you know, and... I picked this one, I, I'm not one to say that all, all modern stuff sounds alike, but there are certain tendency, tendencies, I should say, um, you know, kind of romantic style melodies and, and grandiose stuff. So, so if you have anything similar to this that a student is working on, um, this is a great, this, this will hopefully help give you some ideas for that repertoire. Um, so this is, this is a place where we're gonna be talking about leaps, kind of like in the Tchaikovsky. So we have these, these big leaps right at the beginning. All right. So automatically when students play this, you know, this is what I see. And let me, let me see if I can show you from the side. This is what I see is. Uh, let me see if I can play the right notes. All right. So, you know, they're, they're, launching themselves and, and, and no wonder they have trouble playing it. No wonder I just had trouble playing it. They're so focused on, you know, rocketing their body across the keyboard, you know, it, it's, it's no wonder that they, don't, um, that they don't accomplish anything very quickly. So let me pull up that overhead again and show you again, we have, so I, I tend to think Right here, I can accomplish that without moving too much over to the left. If I move a lot over to the left, then I have to move a lot over to the right. So if I, if I start here, then I'm already in a better place and I move back and to the right and then back over this. And again, rather than, I don't wanna go, myself across, instead I go back to the right, and then that happens. And then the left hand comes across, and I would just play it just like I'm doing it right now. I went down too far. All right, so I wouldn't try to get over like this. You're you're literally up there for one note. If if you're if if you can't handle playing one note at that arm angle, then you've got other issues we have to deal with. All right. So the left hand comes over like this, and then I'm just going to play this so that you can see the gradual progression of the right hand. Uh, let's see. Was pants in that, but there's your there's that motion of the right hand just across. And there you are. And so it continues. All right, so those are just a couple examples of, of lateral motion as it relates to uh, broken intervals and then lateral motion as it relates to leaps. Um, and I, I could go on and on about that, but I want to be this time and uh, move forward. So the next thing that I'd like to talk about is forearm shaping. And 
I, I think I'm probably going to end up tacking a little bit of this onto next month's workshop because I, I don't think I have the time to do it justice, but I think that I can at least hopefully give you a preview and a an basic understanding of what forearm shaping is. And of course, as I mentioned already, the purpose of forearm shaping, the purpose of all of this is to create a musical effect. We want music, not technique in our playing. Technique is the foundation, but we want, we want the result to be music. Just as we would not want to live on a concrete slab, we want walls and a roof and paint on our walls and furniture. Um, we would not want that concrete slab though to be not be there. And so technique is our concrete slab and music is all the other stuff that happens around it. So, and that's, that's an example I use to my students. They can understand that, especially here in Texas, construction is going down all the time. They, they see houses being built in days. They see foundations poured and then the frame up the next day. And, and so they understand that concept. Most, most kids understand that concept. Um, so forearm shaping is the combination of all four forearm motions being used to create the desired musical effect. So rotation, in and out, up and down, right, left, lateral, working together to create the desired musical effect. So I think it was in my very first lecture, and let me see if I can show this from a close-up. There we go. Uh, side camera. Even just moving between two notes. All right. There's an element of rotation. There's an element of out, it could be in. There's an element of up, it could be down. I wouldn't probably do that, maybe that. But there's an element of all those motions there. And then there's an, also an element, as we talked about already today, and I, I don't need to beat a dead horse. Um, there's an element of left and right. So we, we take those shapes then, or those, those motions then rather, and we create what we, a, a couple generalized shapes, all right? We have what we would call an over shape, all right? Over meaning it kind of arches over like this. So for example, if, if in my left hand, I come up to my thumb, I create an over shape. So I'm moving, I, I have an overall upward incline even though i'm moving from uh, even though i'm moving to a shorter shorter finger i have that that over over you know or if you have a pattern like this so up to the thumb down out so i'm creating i'm creating this shape and and that that shapes the music all right so i am still putting this in in very technical terms but it does shape the music. Ah. All right. And it's a combination of ups and downs. And this is best shown, I'm going to talk about one more, or a couple more things, and then I'm just going to leap into some examples and, 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 and show you these things in, in action. Um, the, so if there's an over sound, or over, rather, over shape, then there must be an undershape, right? Um, and that is true. I tend to prefer to use the word across because over, over works fine because I can get height from my fingers, but under tends to make people want to pull their wrist down so that if they, if they are shaping, for example, the opposite direction, they want to do that rather than just, just move across, all right? So if I go, so I'm going over on my way down and then across over and my wrist is moving in unison with the arm, it's not doing anything independently of its own. Hopefully, hopefully that uh, shows well. I guess I could show that on a closer camera. That way you can see it. So I'm moving, if I, let's say I start down, so I'm gonna go across or under, then 
over. So you see it working itself out in the arm. So that, so that all, all those motions are happening, rotation in and out, all that stuff is happening, but it's happening to such a tiny degree that what you see is the overall shape, the combination of that. Then I wanna talk a little bit, now this is where it can get confusing. Whoops, wrong camera. Um, so last time we talked about up and down motions. Now I'm gonna talk about up and down sounds, all right? So we have sounds at the piano that go down, whoops, and we have sounds that go up, all right? And there's a difference, all right? Now down, generally we start from above the key and drop down into the key, and up we start on the surface of the key and play up from the key. Now, again, there's some disagreement over terminology. There's also a forward sound and all that. And like I say, I don't have time to get into all that minutia. And so hopefully next time I can, I can tack a little bit of this lecture onto the beginning of the next le lecture. But in its basic form, there's up sounds, there's down sounds. So if I go, I could, I, and the nice thing about these up and down sounds is you can combine them. So I could go, I could go down, up, down. I could go up, down, up, all right? And it changed, my up and my down change the sound. Oftentimes when we hear a um, passage of octaves, and I'm just gonna play a chromatic scale in octaves, but when we hear octaves, you know, it's all down, so we hear down. And you know, I, I just, I dare you not to pick the fuzz uh, that's remaining from your brain out of your ears after hearing that. Um, it's, it's just atrocious. So instead, we can combine our downs and ups. So we could go down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Up. Uh, let's see if, if I can do it and say it at the same time. If I can't. <laughs> I'm going down, up, down, up, down, up. So rather than just all downs, instead I'm going to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, And then I get some variety in the sound. But that's also a very busy sound, down, up, down, up, down, up. But that's a lot to think about. So instead, what if I think about down, down, up, up, down, 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 I'm able to play octaves that don't sound just completely terrible, um, and it, it gives me variety. It allows me to shape instead of just jackhammering into the keys, all right? Um, the last thing I want to say before, uh, before I jump into a, at, least, at least one example um, is we have these, this concept, this idea of legato. And you know from earlier lectures that I, I, I don't worry about that when I'm be teaching beginning students. I want them to focus on arm weight, so we tend to just ignore any slurs or anything. Um, but at the same time, they're learning a valuable thing by picking up their arm because legato is not a physical thing, okay? Legato, and this is, this is one of my favorite things that Sheila Page ever says, and I, I cannot say it. Um, without crediting her, because that would be plagiarism, or I, I guess, I don't know if it's plagiarism when you speak it, but it'd be wrong. Um, and she says, and, and it's so true, and I always have to remind myself that legato is a state of ear, okay? Legato is a state of ear. Now, that's not saying you can't create a physical connection between notes. Sometimes you can, but and I'm gonna demonstrate this in just a moment, you can have the most legato technique in the world and it doesn't sound like a phrase. It doesn't sound like a legato phrase. It sounds like, mm, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't have musicality to it. So we create long lines in music by keeping the arm in motion, the full arm. So singers, wind players, they have their wind column. If the wind stops, if their air stops, 
the sound stops. Violinists, violists, uh, string players, um, or at least bowed string players, have a bow. When that bow stops, their sound stops. Pianists have forearms. When their forearm stops, their sound stops. And I don't mean literally, unfortunately, because of the nature of the instrument, but in terms of musicality, if your arm stops, your sound stops. And again, don't, I don't have as much time on this as I'd like. I'll demonstrate a bit of it and talk a bit more about it next, next time. But my favorite comparison with my, for, for my students, my favorite analogy is imagine going to a retaining pond. Most of them, if they don't know what a retaining pond is, you can very quickly explain it. It's a pond that does not have any fresh water flowing in or out of it. It's just, it's there. And it's usually got some kind of gross green gunk over the surface. And it's just, and, and I always tell them, imagine going there and taking a glass, dipping it in there, and taking a drink of that water. And they always go, oh, you know, and I do too, because it's, it's, an, it's a gross thought, right? And I always tell them that music like water is best when it's fresh and it's freshest when it's in motion. So you want your music, you want your arm to be in motion to create long musical lines. It's choreography, all right? And hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll learn some more about that as, as we go forward with these workshops. But um, it's, a very, it's a very important concept that that you can't have musical lines with your arms stopping dead in every note. So on, with that uh, in mind, I am going to, well, actually, I think, mm, I'm going to, I think, do the overhead camera. Because I want you to see if you can spot, I'm going to go, I have a second excerpt if you're looking at the examples, I have a second excerpt from that Moonlight Fantasy by Melody Bober. And um, it's measures, I think you have measures maybe 24 through 29. Um, and I'm going to play really 24 through 28. And I want you to see if you can I'm going to do something different, and I want you to see if you can spot what I do, okay? Let me see if I can do it. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you, I don't know if you spotted it. I'm going to do it again. Hopefully you saw it that time around. I played that left hand melody with one finger. I used one finger. Now, I am not purporting that as a way of, as a means of playing this, all right? I'm not telling you to, to have your students play uh, all melodies with one finger or this melody with one finger. What I'm suggesting to you is that and I'm going to, now I'm going to do the fingering that's written there. I'm sorry, I switched too soon. Except I, the, the intervals, of course, I had to use two fingers to play. Um, but I'm going to do the fingering that is suggested or something close to it in, in this. So I'm going to do the legato melody fingering, all right? The notes under the slurs connected, didn't it? Didn't it sound great? Uh, it, you know, I, and I'm again, I'm not, I'm not purporting myself to be a great artist or anything, but I think 
anybody would prefer to, uh, I know for myself, I can't speak for anybody else. I would prefer to hear the first one with a non-legato fingering or with a legato fingering than the second one with either of those fingerings. So, so musicality has to reign supreme. And that's a good example. You cannot play, this is a good way to get your students moving their arm. You cannot play a melody with one finger without your arm being in motion. has to stay in motion and so that's a great way of getting them to move their arm and then eventually they learn that they can do it sorry I keep forgetting that's there so they're able to then move their arm as they're playing that so that's that's an example of legato being a state of ear not so much of uh, a specific shape um, though if you want to talk about a specific shape, the right hand on those triplets is doing what we would call an over shape. Over, across, which over is basically the fingers walking in and up. So in and up, in and up, and it creates that, that over that we talked a little bit about earlier. So that's what's happening there. Now I do want to just pop back over to those couple measures of the Mozart. Um, and we'll wrap up with that. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the shape there. All right. So we already determined that, that we have to have a prominent left, left right motion there to make it work, right? Um, but let's, let's just say that we, that we get that idea. We, 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 we have that, that, that left right motion. So I'm going to play it using just. Mm, I guess full body is going to be the best view for this, using just the left-right motion. So just starting right there in measure 68. All right, that was, that was, there was a little rotation in there. I, I can't help, I can't help it. All right, so that was rotation in left-right, all right? So it sounds a little, it sounds busy, especially as, as I get down there, all right? And, and so it's not, it's not great. Now, if I, let's say I add a little bit of what we've talked about. So now I'm, 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 I'm building out to this idea of, of, of not just in and out, up, down, but what motion do I want? What sounds do I want? So we've talked about over and under shapes and we've talked about up and down sounds. So I'm going to now think, of, uh, sorry, creating an over shape and then coming down. So I have, oops, I'm coming up, I'm staying up, and I'm exaggerating a little bit so you can see it, so I can't do it too fast. Now I'm up and I'm coming down, down, up, up, down, uh, sorry, sorry, down, up, up, stay up, down. So I'm working my way up and down. So it's it's not it's not sudden ups and downs. So I'm and as I work my way up, now I'm gonna work my way down. Now I'm back down. I'm I wanna be the most down on my downbeat, usually, not always. Alright. Now I'm gonna start working my way back up. Again, exaggerating here, stay up, work my way down. Now here's a tricky one. I don't want to get too far down, and this is what I was talking about earlier. I don't want to get too far down because I have to get to this, this F sharp and A. So instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down, but then I'm going to use this 5 on the G to throw me up, and then I can get a good down there. And if you use just a splash of pedal, I, I, again, to me it sounds more legato than if I do that. That sounds more legato to me using 5-5 five, five than using 5-4. So there's another example of if you get the motion into it, then, then you maintain that legato sound. So I'm going to try it in speed here. Um, so again, it's going to be down, work my way up. 
uh, sorry, down, work my way up, then work my way down, then up, and there I am, all right? I wasn't sure if I could do it. I was talking my way through it, but I kind of did. So uh, now I'm going to just demonstrate and not talk. And I did the wrong fingering there on the end, sorry. Creatures of habit, that's, that's the fingering I learned it with, and that's the fingering that my brain wants me to do, I suppose. Hmm. There we go. All right. And so you can make that happen. And, and what I love about that shape of having the up and the down is you get, to me at least, it sounded almost just like this crystalline, shimmering sound from those six. They just, they, they sound playful and I think they're meant to be playful. I, I, I'm not here to lecture on Mozart and, and characteristics of his music, but I think that that's a good characteristic for those notes right there. It's just kind of shimmering and playful and light sounding. Um, just as an aside note, and, and that's, that's it I have to really say on shaping for the day. Um, like I say, hopefully I'll touch on more next time. But the beginning of this, and I'm not going to play a whole lot of it. I'm not as practiced as I'd like to be. Um, the beginning of this is also great. I didn't use it on purpose because I wanted to talk. I, I think more, uh, even though this piece itself is a little bit more advanced, I think students are more likely to run into something with sixth, doing something like that, than they are to run into something like at the beginning of this where you have, where, where you have that. But if you have a student playing this, this is another great example of a place where that left, right is very, important and, 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 and again you want to plan for the bigger interval when you're thinking so think about the direction of the bigger interval um, and that'll that'll help you um, I think that's a bit about all that I have to say thank you Celiana I'm, I'm glad to um, have done some validating for you it's it's always nice to know that know that what you're doing is being done by others and that it's getting the results hopefully that you want from it so great